Hello and welcome to our service for today, Sunday the 7th of February. Whether you're a regular member of the church here in Kingham and Churchill or joining in from afar, you're very welcome. I'm David Salter, I'm the vicar here. The Lord be with you. As we meet together today, we're still in lockdown. Now, Cathy kindly sent a link to a super video made by a Marsh family about their lockdown experience. We're totally fixed where we are. There were lots of things in the song that resonate about being stuck inside, not going anywhere. And yet there are still things going on. On Wednesday, we had the funeral of Jill Everett here in Kingham Church, celebrating her life, working in London and East Africa and in Papua New Guinea before retiring here to Kingham. These are some of the lovely flowers that were put in for Jill's funeral. We could only have a few people in church, but it was lovely to see a crowd gathered outside to say goodbye to Jill. And the service was recorded, so I'm hoping we'll be able to see that in due course. Do let me know if you'd like to have the details. On Thursday, I took the funeral for Sam Elliott, who came and joined us when she moved to Churchill. You'll remember her, I'm sure, and her dog, Tigger. Before she lived in Churchill, Sam lived in Broadwell, and apparently there was a huge crowd gathered there to pay their respects as the hearse drove by. And another crowd in Stowe outside the hotel Sam used to own and run. Then, uh, on Friday, you may have noticed a drone flying over the church in Kingham. And that was taking pictures of the roof, and there was an internal survey as well, gathering information for our upcoming feasibility study. We're looking at how we can develop the church to make it more hospitable and fully useful to gather together in. I'm really looking forward to seeing those pictures and even more to those plans coming together. Please do pray for the PCC as we take each careful step forward. Last week, we came to the end of the season of Epiphany, and it's 10 days still to go before the beginning of Lent, which always starts just after Pancake Day, of course. Some people might suggest that's the wrong, wrong way around. Today and next Sunday, we have the treat of visiting speakers. Gareth Harper is joining us today. He's an ordinand, training for ordination at St Melitus College and on the staff team at St Mary's in Chipping Norton. With all that's been in the news over recent months, particularly around Donald Trump, about fake news and conspiracy theories, I've asked Gareth to preach on a particular passage from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. So as we come together to worship God this morning, Please join me in our prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You'll notice that even though we're no longer in Epiphany, we're still thinking about how the light and love of Christ shine on us and through us to others. So let's sing together our first hymn, Thou Whose Almighty Word.
whenever we gather to worship, it's good to confess our sins. Hear the words of our Saviour Jesus Christ. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me shall never walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Let us therefore bring our sins into his light and confess them in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring you his pardon and peace, now and forever. Amen. At this point in the service, when we're all together in church, I'd usually pray for Kids Zone, and then they'd go and join in their activities. Today, they're going to be looking at the clearing of the temple, when Jesus turned over the tables of the money changers and told people very clearly that it was to be a place of prayer, not a den of thieves. Let's pray for them now, as they'll be meeting on Zoom at 10 o'clock this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the children and young people who are part of your church here. We pray for them and their leaders today. Please build them up in faith and love, and give them a really good time as they meet together today. We're aware that life is strange at the, mo at the moment, most of them studying at home instead of at school. Please bless them and their families and continue to call them all more and more into your love. Amen. Since we first started making these video services, we've included a number of interviews, which have been great, and you can still go and look at them on YouTube if you want to. This morning, we have an interview between Keith Dunnett, the Vicar of Christ Church in Abingdon, and Dom and Katie from his congregation. This is part of the build-up to Come and See, our invitation to explore the Christian faith during the season of Lent. Katie, a huge welcome to you. Thanks for spending some time with us. And you've both had quite a journey of faith over uh, the last uh, number of years. So just tell us something of your, your journey. I was brought up in a Christian family um, and regularly attended church, but, but God was never real to me. I went off the rails a bit in my adolescence and on some pretty hard drugs. Um, I was actually challenged by a, a Christian friend of mine to, uh, to go to rehab. Um, I was 19 years of age and uh, the, the rehab that I went to was a it was a Christian rehab, a, a rehab called the Nehemiah Project. A, a secular rehab will restore you to your former state prior to using drugs. And of course, prior to using drugs, as I learned, I had a lot of shame, a lot of fear, guilt, rejection, abuse in, in my life, anger, hurt that that needed to heal. And it was when I was 19, like I said, that I came back to this Christian conference that I'd attend with my family once a year at Easter, um, that I was invited to open my life to God and, and ask him in. And actually, it was from that point um, that I left the drugs behind and, uh, and gave my life to the Lord. Um, and he started to unpick some of the issues that led me into that place and um, that I was unaware of when, when I came back to Abingdon, which is where I grew up. Um, it's where, where I met Katie. I grew up in a non-Christian family um, and um, proud atheist was probably <laughs> sort of a description even to this day that um, that my family have, have, have had. But um, I I didn't believe, I, I just did not feel that there was any God at all um, of any form. When Dominic and I reconnected after so many years, I, I really did turn around to him and say, I'm 
I'm not interested in in any of the the Jesus talk you have. During our our relationship, um, Dominic didn't sort of talk too much about his faith, but he did. He you know he was quite significant in me coming to to faith because he wanted to start a, reattending a church, um, and you know he invited me along. And I guess over the time, I must have felt a bit curious and thought, hey, why not? And what was it like for you, you know, to start? You know, coming along to a church, quite a big thing to do as, a, as someone being an atheist. What, what was your experience? My expectation was I'd just be listening to some some vicar talk about God and have no idea what they were talking about. And that was like my expectation. But actually, I sort of walked into the, the church that day and um, I don't know, it felt something I never thought I'd felt before there was something different um the day I walked in and almost just greeted actually which was strange because I kind of walked in expecting to just not really talk to anybody um and then to walk back out again and probably just keep going a couple of times with Dominic whilst he wanted to attend but it, it was the opposite to my expectation At this point of going I was Still very much, I considered myself an atheist. So actually, it was a big step. I felt that like my uh, my heart had been softened slightly to say, yes, I'll, I'll go. Um, and we, you know, we attended. And yeah, just really one of those last worship sessions, I really felt something which, for me, was the Holy Spirit coming into my life. What difference does faith in Jesus make to you now? Knowing Jesus... And knowing his character and the love that he has for us, um, that he's for us, that he's not against us, that he will support us, that he'll challenge us even for our good, gives you a real uh, grounding in life. It gives me a real sense of security. Um, It gives me a real sense of um, confidence, actually, in in my walk with him, but but also because of that, my, my walk with other people. What I'm learning as I'm growing in faith is that even when I do make wrong decisions, he has no room in his heart for for hate or for rejection. And and so I'm on this kind of learning process of, wow, you still actually love me. You're still actually for me, even though I've made the same mistake again. That's that's tremendous, isn't it? We we wear L plates the whole of our lives as we follow Jesus. It's so exciting to see that. Before I was a Christian, I I filled my life with with lots of other material things, um, and actually now I feel feel that there is a you know I never I never not had love in my life, but I really feel that there is a love in my life. It's made me feel you know just that there there is sort of more to life than um, than meets the eye. Oh, that's tremendous. Oh, Dom and Katie, your story is so inspirational. Thank you for spending time with us this afternoon. or you're unsure then you need to tap into to what that is and if you come out of it just with some other friendships it, yeah why, why wouldn't you spend that time you've got absolutely nothing to lose you can sign up with the diocese for daily reflections and videos through lent and or contact me to join a five session online course starting in about three weeks time. Now it's time for the collect or special prayer for today. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have created the heavens and the earth and made us in your own image. Teach us to discern your hand in all your works 
and your likeness in all your children. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit reigns supreme over all things, now and for ever. Amen. Now Sam is going to read our Bible reading for today. The reading today is taken from 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 3 to 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray before we listen to Gareth's sermon. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth of your love for every one of us. Thank you for the Bible and for the good news of Jesus. And thank you for the Holy Spirit who helps us to hear what you are saying and helps us come close to you. Please move in us and draw us closer to you. For your glory's sake. Amen. Hello friends, it's wonderful to be with you today, albeit via the medium of the internet. You join me here in my house in Chipping Norton, at least I say I'm in my house in Chipping Norton. You actually have no idea, you've probably never been to my house. I could have fled to Dubai at the start of this lockdown with my vast amounts of wealth and simply be pretending that I'm in Chipping Norton now. How would you know? Now look, I am in Chipping Norton. If you listen carefully, you can hear the faint ringing of the industrial estate opposite my house. I don't have vast amounts of wealth, that's for sure. I'm a trainee vicar. I'm not a hoax, I'm not a joke, nor am I a conspiracy theory. But it does highlight the fact that in this post-truth world of fake news and disinformation, and in these days when so much of our lives are being conducted online, the fact is that as a society, our relationship to how we understand truth and even how we understand reality is changing rapidly. Back in March 2020, as the pandemic was taking hold across Europe, Tom Phillips, the editor of the fact-checking organisation Full Fact, wrote an article in The Guardian where he debunked a wide range of myths about the virus and concluded that we face a global public health crisis in the age of unprecedented and rampant misinformation. Good health advice can make the difference between life and death. This is serious stuff. Truth and lies can make the difference between life and death. And let's be honest, this is kind of uncomfortable to think about. It's daunting, it's a bit scary. Very few people actually set out to share fake news on social media, and yet we're all prone to the ramifications of it. And so I think it's vital that as Christians, we don't shrink back from engaging with these issues in our society. We need to consider what it looks like in this day and age to be servants of the God who says, let light shine out of darkness. As the church, we need to take a step back every now and then and be prayerful, discerning and considerate of how we respond to these things. In an era when truth and lies can make the difference between life and death, what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus Christ, the one who is the way, the truth? and the life. Well, the author and pastor Mark Sayers, in a really helpful podcast about how the church should respond to conspiracy theories, points out that most of the prominent conspiracies flying around today are actually quite attractive to Christians, because they often sound quite like a distorted version of the gospel narrative, just a bit flashier. Now, this is where I think we can learn a lot from the Apostle Paul and today's passage in 2 Corinthians. Paul speaks of how the gospel has become veiled or distorted to those who are perishing and also highlights how the truth of the gospel and the work of the church is found not in proclaiming ourselves or trying to make ourselves feel valuable or important like we're somehow in the know, 
but rather instead of proclaiming ourselves and our ideologies and our theories about life, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who is shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now let's zoom out a little and consider the wider context of the church in Corinth that the Apostle Paul is writing to. Corinth was this Greek city-state until the Romans laid it to waste about 150 years before the birth of Christ. And it's an empty ghost town for a century until none other than Julius Caesar himself orders its resettlement. And most scholars believe that as many as 50,000 people were sent to resettle Corinth in 44 BC and that the vast majority of these people were what were called Libertini. Libertini was this class of recently freed slaves, but in terms of the social scripts of the day, they were considered by Roman society to be only one social class above those who still were slaves. And so Corinth has this real stigma attached to it. And in a culture where honour and shame are really important values, Corinth becomes this running joke in Roman society. It's lacking in honour. It's full of recently freed slaves. And so another century later, the Apostle Paul, on one of his missionary journeys, stays in Corinth for a year and a half and plants a church in the middle of this context. And the church grows and people come to know Jesus. And then Paul heads off to the next Holy Spirit inspired adventure. And after Paul has moved on, he later hears that things aren't going all that well within the church in Corinth. There were arguments breaking out. There's spiritual abuse. There were divisions between the rich and the poor. And some people were even taking other members of the church to court. It's a mess. And so Paul writes and he visits and he addresses this stuff in what we now call 1 Corinthians. And he's trying to correct these problems. But many of the church reject his teaching and question his authority. Now, for us today, it seems odd to imagine questioning the authority of the Apostle Paul. But we've got to remember that Corinth was a city of people descended from freed slaves, a city of low honour and low value. So the economics and politics of Corinth were all shaped by attempts to acquire more value and more honour. And so when a bunch of well-off, flashy and impressive false apostles turn up and start preaching a flashy and distorted version of the gospel at the church in Corinth, the church decides to follow their version of the gospel and rejects Paul. Because Paul wasn't very impressive. He was actually quite poor. He was even homeless a lot of the time. And he suffered a lot. Why on earth? Should they listen to Paul? It makes much more sense to listen to these seemingly flashy, valuable and honourable false apostles. Now, eventually, after more writing and visiting from Paul, most, not all, most of the Corinthian church realise their arrogance, apologise to Paul and repent. So Paul writes the letter that we now call to Corinthians to assure the church in Corinth that he loves them and he's committed to them despite the incredibly painful journey they've been on in the last few years. And so in our passage for today, Paul is saying, if our message, the gospel, is obscure to anyone, it's not because we're holding back in any way. No, it's because these other people, these flashy false apostles and their followers, are looking or going the wrong way and refuse to give it serious attention. All they have eyes for is the fashionable God of darkness, the enemy, the Satan, peddling conspiracies, distortions and fake news in the rough shape of the gospel. They think he can give them what they want and that they won't have to bother believing a truth they can't see. They're stone blind to the day spring brightness of the message, the gospel that shines with Christ, who gives us the best picture of God we'll ever get. And so when Paul writes to this church full of people descended from freed slaves, living in a city low in honour and value, he turns the whole thing on its head and he says, we don't proclaim ourselves. This isn't the way Christians do things. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. Imagine how loaded with resonance that is for the people of the Corinthian church. We don't elevate ourselves, we lower ourselves, even lower than your ancestors, who you're so ashamed of, for the sake of others and for the sake of Jesus. 
Friends, we've got to be real about the fact that in our day and age, the church is seen as pretty unimpressive compared to some of the flashy false apostles out there offering people false hope in conspiracy theories and fake news. But that's okay. It's always been the case. Paul's job isn't to be impressive, but his job is to point people towards the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. And that is our job too, in the midst of all of this darkness that surrounds us. True Christian discipleship is not about status or value or honour, but it's about pointing people towards the light in the darkness, Jesus Christ. Those pushing conspiracy theories online, they're like the false apostles pushing a distorted version of the gospel. There's one popular conspiracy theory at the moment called QAnon, which basically revolves around a story. And this story says that all will be made well again, thanks to the work of a Messiah figure. That sounds familiar, right? But in the story of QAnon, the Messiah figure is Donald Trump, one of the wealthiest people in the world, and until a few weeks ago, one of the most powerful. But in the narrative we proclaim in the gospel, the Messiah figure is a Jewish rabbi, born to a poor, penniless couple in a stable and raised in a backwater town in the Middle East. And yet what we believe is that this Jesus, in his poorest and most powerless moment, defeats the power of sin and death. As he gives himself up to be crucified and die in agony and shame upon a cross, he invites us to no longer live in the agony of isolation, nor the shame of separation from God and one another. And he doesn't stop there. Because three days later, Jesus rose victoriously from the grave so that we can now be invited by him to see that death is defeated. We are set free from the shackles of our shame and our slavery. And we are invited into life in all of its fullness by the God who delights in each and every one of us. But if we don't tell the world this truth, then people will settle for a cheap knockoff. In the late 1980s, the theologian Leslie Newbigin argued that pretty much all ideologies essentially seize upon the gospel narrative, nick it, but then veer off course and promise an alternative path to salvation. And we're seeing that with all of the conspiracy theories flying around today and lots of the fake news, whether it's QAnon or anti-vaccine conspiracies. There's always a seed of truth and goodness at the core of these conspiracies. QAnon, for example, places a high value on liberating children from sex trafficking. Anti-vaccine conspiracies ask us to be critical in our engagement with science and politicians. These are undoubtedly good things. But they become distorted by layers and layers of lies and untruths that are all concerned with making those who believe in these things feel like they are somehow in the know. If an online conspiracy theory tells you that you know more about vaccines than the scientists and the politicians and everyone else, then that feels good, right? That means you're important. That means you're valuable and worthy of being honoured. And in our Western society, which does such a lousy job of letting people know that they are loved, valued and worthy of being honoured, is it any wonder that people go looking for solace in conspiracy theories? The ideologies of our day, whether they're long established or recently arisen on the internet, they each essentially seek to offer us the benefits, the value and the love of the kingdom, but without ever acknowledging the authority of God as the king of that kingdom. They offer a flashy gospel with distorted values, where the apostles must be successful and not seek to lower themselves like Paul to the status of slave where the end goal is more honour and value being attributed to my city and my people, not what the true gospel promises, which is the redemption and restoration of all peoples and all things, where the Messiah is found amongst the rich and powerful, rather than where Jesus is, amongst the poor and powerless. So next time you're online, before you post something or send something to a friend, consider it. Be prayerful. Is this true? Is it life-giving? Is it kind? Am I posting news from a respectable source? 
Or am I accidentally putting something out there that's not true and is unhelpful? And if you're not sure, ask somebody. Ask somebody that you trust. Talk about these things with each other. Talk about them in your small group or chat, chat with your vicar. He's kind. He's a nice man. Talk with him. He seems wise, right? And when you see others acting badly online, When you see blatant fake news and lies being shared, when you lament, as I have, at friends falling down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories in these days, don't become angry with them. Remember that in our Western society, people go looking for solace in conspiracy theories because our society does such a lousy job of letting people know that they are loved, valued and worthy of being honoured. So our job is to proclaim a different narrative over them and over our culture. Our job is to reflect the light of Christ into the darkness. Our job is to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and become slaves for the sake of those broken and hurting people who, like the Corinthians, are just looking in this world for value and honour. And our job is in some way tell them, stop this. You're valuable. You are worthy of honour. Because the same God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, who created and sustains all of this, loves you and delights in you. Amen. Well, thank you very much indeed, Gareth. Let's pray together. Lord God, we do thank you for your wonderful love for each one of us. Thank you that in your sight we are valuable, priceless, made in your image. Help us to rejoice in that knowledge. Help us to follow you and always to worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. We're going to continue to think of that wonderful love of Jesus for each one of us. As we sing our next song, My Song is Love Unknown.
Let us now declare what we believe by saying together the words of the Creed. We say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Tony Pilkington is going to lead us in our prayers of intercession. Thank you, Tony. Let us now be still in the presence of God and bring our prayers before him. Father, we bring before you the country of Myanmar which has suffered a military coup this week. We pray for peace in the country and for a swift return to a stable, righteous and democratically elected government. Father, we pray for our government and all those in authority that they would each have your wisdom for every decision that they have to make. May they know what needs to be done and have the courage and the strength to carry it through. We continue to pray, Father, for the situation with regard to COVID-19. We pray for all the medical staff as they care for those who are ill. May they know your encouragement and strength each day. We thank you for the successful rollout of the vaccination programme and we pray that this would continue without any difficulties or interruptions. Father, we pray for the ongoing relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union. We pray particularly that any difficulties with regard to trade, vaccinations and the border with Northern Ireland will be quickly and wisely resolved. Father, we pray for all those who feel particularly isolated and lonely as a result of the current restrictions. We pray that they may know your presence with them and your comfort and strength. Father, we are conscious of a number of people who have died within our local community in recent days. And we pray for all those who have lost friends or family, that they also may know your presence with them and your comfort and your strength 
in these days and in the weeks to come. And now let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Thank you very much, Tony, for leading us in our prayers. We come to our notices, but first I'd like to ask for more prayer, for Roger Shorter particularly. Having been treated for appendicitis, he was on his way home and uh, came back to Penhurst Care Home, but sadly he's had a fall and broken his hip. And so he's had to go into hospital again. So please do pray for him. It's also Michael Farrant's funeral on uh, Tuesday afternoon this week, the 9th of February. Um, we've got as many people uh, booked into the service as we can fit. Um, but if you'd like to join in the procession uh, up from Sidings Road, please do go along there at quarter past two. You can either follow the hearse up the hill or if you just prefer to stand at the side of the road between Sidings Road and the church, um, that would be a lovely thing to do, just to show uh, your respects for Michael and to say goodbye to him. And just an advance notice for you, it'll be Bettine's funeral on Thursday the 18th of February. Uh, that'll be in uh, at Banbury Crematorium. We have our regular Zoom meetings. I mentioned already Kids Zone at 10 o'clock today, our virtual coffee and chat at 11 o'clock, and our prayer meetings, which happen at 7 o'clock on Tuesday morning and on Thursday morning. Or if you want to join the uh, Chipping Norton crew uh, who pray, uh, the, you can join in 6 o'clock in the morning or the evening on any day. Um, please do let me know if you need a link to any of these. And my email address is there for, uh, for our regular Zoom meetings. It will be Shrove Tuesday, a week on Tuesday. So we're planning uh, a pancake party. Um, over Zoom, so um, that would be good fun, particularly for families with young children. So it'll be at four o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday the 16th. Um, the idea is you make your pancakes in advance and uh, bring along to enjoy um, at the end of the party, but there'll be uh, all sorts of things going on in that party. If you want any more information, please do email Sam, and her email address is there, kinghamsam46 at gmail.com. And that'll be really good. Also, during the half-term holiday, there's going to be a pancake trail around Kingham. We're going to have a home group social on the Thursday evening. I hope that will involve some pancakes too. And we're going to have a Zoom service for our Sunday service at the end of half-term. So instead of a recorded video like this one, we'll have a Zoom service where we all meet together at 10 o'clock on Sunday the 21st. And we'll also be doing the draw for the pancake trail at the, in that service. So that's enough notices for now. We're going to have our final hymn now. Let's sing together, All My Days.
Let's close our service together this morning with a prayer for God's blessing. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. And may the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and all those you love today and always. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us today. Uh, I do hope you keep safe and keep well and please do keep in touch with friends and neighbours around. Uh, give me a call or an email if you'd like to. It'd be lovely to, uh, be, to, to chat. Uh, bye for now.